screen. Okay, and yeah, sorry, give me some time. And I'll do the recording. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Yixuan Wang, and uh, I will be today's moderator. Uh, welcome to the third Census Week 4 2022 seminar series. So for those who just joined us for the first time, I just want to um, share, uh, introduce our Census Week a little bit. So the Census Week is a multidisciplinary group of researchers with interests like sensor materials, method, devices, and various applications. So our group provides an opportunity to exchange ideas, present early findings, and explore collaborations and funding opportunities. So our goal is to connect sensor technologies and establish a connection between academia and industry. So today is my great pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, Mr. Yinan Wang. Yinan is a graduate student, uh, is a fifth year graduate, or no, sixth year uh, graduate student in the um, electrical and Computer Engineering Department at UT Austin. He joined Professor Daniel Wasserman's group since 2017. His research involves using microwave structures as pho photoconductor platforms to make high-speed made-infrared um, detectors, as well as characterizing the time response of ultra-thin photovoltaic uh, made-infrared detectors for high-speed applications. So he has published extens extensively on the technologies and applications for uh, miniature and potable spectrometers. The topic for his today's presentation is novel device uh, architectures for high-speed made infrared photo detectors. So for our audiences, um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type them in the chat and we will try to answer them um, at the end of this talk. So Yinan, the floor is yours. Thank you. I will start sharing my slides um, um, oh, after we finished. Yep. yep. Stop here. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so, um, thank you everyone for coming to my presentation today. It is a great honor and pleasure for me to present at the Census Rig and share with you some of my research on high speed mid infrared photo detectors using novel device architectures. Um, one of my previous colleagues also presented at the census rig last year, and a large part of my work is directly based on his previous work. So it is really special for me to have this opportunity today, and I hope and hopefully I can deliver an interesting talk to all of you. And um, so first, I would like to introduce a little bit about our group. We are the mid IR photonics group here at UT Austin, led by Professor Daniel Wasserman. Um, our group focuses on research about photonics and optoelectronic devices working in the mid-infrared wavelength range. Our group designs, grows, fabricates, and characterizes materials and devices for the generation, detection, and or man man manipulation of infrared light. So in the past, we have worked with nanophotonics with the micro scale photons, and starting with some of the work I will present today, we're also pushing the time scale of these devices into the sub-nanoseconds. Um, here's an outline of my talk. I will give, first give a short introduction about high-speed mid-infrared applications and the short history of high-speed IR detectors in general. Then I will, I will talk about the two major directions we have investigated in. For the mid-wave IR, we have looked at microwave readout photoconductors, and for the long-wave IR, we look at the ultra-thin type 2 super lattice detectors um, for high-speed operations. And finally, I will end with uh, the, con the conclusions and some possible future work. Um, so the mid IR spectrum is um, really interesting to the research community and industry for a couple of reasons. There is two very distinct atmospheric transmission windows here, one from 3 to 5 microns and one from 8 to 14 microns, which we named the mid-wave IR and the long-wave IR respectively. This allows for applications such as um, mid IR LIDAR and free space optical communications. Um, there are also re rich physics in this range, um, typically, uh, say, uh, the molecular vibrational resonances and thermal imaging. And the, the, these, um, the, these type of, uh, types of physics lead to very important applications such as uh, gas sensing, spectroscopy, and thermal imaging, and many more. Um, recently, we have seen the rapid development of uh, new IR sources such as the quantum cascade lasers and interbatten cascade lasers. Um, these kinds of new sources um, offer high power together with high speed and high bandwidth. 
And this allows for the demonstration of many IR related applications that involves high speed and high bandwidth, such as injection locking and the generation of mid IR frequency combs. New types of spectroscopy techniques, such as the dual comb spectroscopy, uh, can take advantage directly of these mid IR frequency combs. And these applications require your IR detectors to have bandwidth also in the upper hundreds of megahertz, megahertz or even into the gigahertz, which is one of the many motivations for making high speed mid infrared detectors. Um, historically, high-speed IR detector research has been pushed forward mostly by the optical fiber communication and photonic integrated circuits industry, where they mostly work around near-infrared wavelengths or around 15-15 nanometers. Um, so the dominant kind of photodetectors here are the photovoltaic heterojunction photodiodes, such as the PN photodiodes or the unitraveling carrier photodiodes. So these carriers can uh, achieve extremely high bandwidth, um, well above 100 gigahertz, but that is achieved by reducing the dimensions of detector thickness and also area. And this does add some tra trade-offs in terms of quantum efficiency. And in the near IR wavelength, you're allowed to do that because your absorb absorbers are still pretty high in terms of absorption coefficient. But as we move towards longer wavelength, um, making high-speed detectors isn't as straightforward as just replacing the materials in these types of structures. Um, uh, it is because the, the at longer wavelengths, your absorber material has narrow again, uh, narrower band gaps, and that leads to higher dark currents. The absorption coefficients are also smaller compared to the near-IR counterparts. And as we can see here, in the mid-wave IR, even using similar structures such as PIN and unitraveling carriers, the achievable bandwidth is only a fraction of what has been shown for the telecommunication wavelengths. And at long wave IR, it is even more difficult to use bulk materials because the band gap is even narrower and the absorption coefficient also even smaller. Um, so the kind of high speed detectors in this range has predominantly been photoconductive quantum well or quantum dot infrared detectors or quantum cascade detectors. Um, they achieve really high speed because the upper state lifetime of these quantum states are, pre are pretty fast. Uh, but um, their responsivity is much, much worse compared to, say, using a bulk material. So that is your intrinsic trade-off. Um, in the next part, I will talk about some of our work on these two different wavelength ranges. So starting with the mid-wave IR, where we look at the microwave fo uh, readout photoconductors. So the microwave readout photoconductors is something our work, uh, our group has worked on extensively in the past um, to, uh, to use it as an IR detector platform. We started by looking at uh, the split ring, the micro uh, micro strip split ring resonators, um, the, the, yeah, the micro strip uh, split ring resonators, and, and we have verified that uh, we can achieve uh, high sensitivity and time resolved measurements using different kinds of active materials. In one of my past works, um, we coupled the SR with a standalone fast recombination lifetime indium antimony pixel that had a lifetime smaller than one nanosecond which pushed uh, the bandwidth of these detector start, uh, into the gigahertz range. But we also found, found that there are two major limits to the detector performance. Uh, first is that because we're using a resonator here, it is associated with the charging time that ultimately limited the speed of these detectors to about 200 picoseconds. And also um, the lifetime of the photoconductive material isn't, um, isn't fast enough. Um, so that also limited the bandwidth. So we improved on that idea and made a few changes to our device design. So first we switched to a simpler coplanar waveguide structure that avoided the re resonator charging time, um, which was limiting the bandwidth. And the other very interesting thing we did is that um, we are using surface recombination, which is usually an unwanted, an unwanted effect for these type of absorbers. And we're using it to our, our advantage. Um, we etched nanometer scale hole arrays um, on the absorber pixels to introduce additional surface recombination uh, via the exposed sidewalls, and that can reduce the overall lifetime of these photoconductive materials. So um, the effective lifetime and thus the detector speed is actually dependent on the geometry of the holes we etched in it. And uh, from our calculations, we found that using nanometer scale hole arrays, we can effectively push the lifetime of these materials into the picosecond range. Um, so shown here is some of the time response we have measured from these uh, holy detectors. Um, we can see that um, compared to the blank pixels, which was not patterned, um, the pattern uh, the pattern pixels show show a much faster response, and the time time scales um, are reduced from around 400 picoseconds for the unpatterned pixel down to about 40 picoseconds, 
which is about the 10 times, uh, 10 times improvement. And using the expressions we've shown in, in the previous slide, we can actually do a fitting of, a fitting of the response. And we saw that the mobility uh, ranges from about 120 to 2,000 centimeters squares per volt seconds, which is uh, within the expect within what we usually expect for these kind of materials um, for the home abilities. And the bandwidth of these detectors can be obtained by extracting the 3 dB bandwidth from the calculated Fourier transform spectra of these time responses, and we saw a similar improvement. So compared to the blank pixels, the small uh, the whole whole pixel with the smallest period shown about a 10 times improvement in bandwidth. And another interesting interesting thing about these detectors is that the amplitude reduction, although it's by about two or three times, it is actually tracking pretty well with the absorber field factor. So it's not because we reduce, say, the response per unit area, but it's actually because we lost um, some um, absorber material from the edge. So this uh, gives us a very inter interesting way to improve the performance of these detectors. So uh, in, in the future, we can shrink both the period and diameter together while keeping a similar fill factor. And we expect that we can simply push the bandwidth larger without actually losing much of the response amplitude. Um, so that would be one way to further improve these detectors. And, but currently, it's, also, it's already showing some pre pretty promising results for making high-speed mid-air detectors, uh, mid-air photoconductors. Yeah. And in the next part, I will talk about um, some of our work in the long wave IR where we use the ultra thin type 2 super large detectors for high speed um, operations. Um, so as a short introduction, um, the type 2 super lattice is a new family of IR materials where the operation wavelength and also the device architecture as a whole can be controlled by uh, controlling the epitaxial growth. And compared with traditional bulk materials, this kind of materials have reduced OJ recombination and dark currents. And although we have structures like the MBN or the complementary barriers uh, structures, where we can reduce our current by blocking the flow of majority current majority carriers, um, the detector speed is still limited by the thickness because uh, if you have a diffusion diffusion dominated current, um, the the time scale of these currents will also scale um, with the detector thickness. It's a pretty simple calculation, and so for. Uh, if we want to achieve high-speed uh, operation of these detectors, it is really desirable to reduce the detector thickness, but that's only if we can maintain the quantum efficiency of these detectors, otherwise it totally defeats the purpose. Um, fortunately for me, a lot of the foundational work has already, already been done by um, my previous colleague, uh, Dr. Leon Norton, uh, which was the previous uh, sensor surrogate presenter, and he's also in the audience today. Um, so he combined the type two super lattice materials uh, so uh, he implemented the type two super lattice material inside an MBN structure and combined that structure with a doped semiconductor layer as a metallic backplane that supported plasmonic modes that enhances the optical absorption in the absorption layer. Um, this detector was named the plasmonic infrared quantum engineered ultra thin epitaxial detector, and the the incoming IR radiation of 10 microns um, is coupled into the surface pl plasma polariton modes via the patch antennas, um, which enhances the op optical absorption in, 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 the, in, in an absorber layer that, that is only 300 nanometers thin, uh, which is about 1 30th of the op uh, operating wavelength. Um, it is still able of achieving an external quantum efficiency of about 40%, which is really impressive. And because the absorber is so thin, the dark current was found to be lower than the state of the art mercury cadmium telluride detectors, which is up to this day still the most common type of IR detectors um, material. And because the detector is so thin, we're also expecting that the uh, operation speeds of these de detectors can be really high. And in, in order to invest investigate that, um, we took special measures to um, we took special measures for the signal integrity. Um, so specifically. We fabricated these detectors into smaller circular mesas and coupled them with um, Copernicus waveguide readouts targeting a 50 ohm characteristic impedance. We also uh, put a, a lot of effort into reducing the parasitic capacitance of these detectors and then measure the time response of them using a femtosecond pulse laser and um, analyze the signals with a high speed oscilloscope. Shown in this slide are some of the time response we measured as a function of applied bias. Um, for the different mesas, um, mesa sizes, and we can see that as the mesa size decreases, the time scale also decreases for the responses. And the shortest forward time max we have observed observed for these time response are even smaller than 30 picoseconds, which is pretty fast. 
And we can similarly extract the 3D, 3db bandwidth as a function of bias by calculating the, the Fourier transform of the spectra. And we get uh, this plot here. Although there seems to be a bandwidth plot at around um, minus, point, uh, minus 50 millivolts, we actually found that it is more like a mathematical artifact because there was a flattening out of a reverse sign component uh, that led to this bandwidth plot. And um, it is not... Uh, it, it is not where the detector typically operates in, but even at a moderate moderate opt, uh, operating voltage of around minus 0.5 volts, uh, where the response of the detector pretty much saturates, we're still observing pretty high bandwidth. And for the smallest mesas, it is around 4.5 gigahertz, which is uh, very impressive for um, for a, uh, for a quasi bulk material working in the long wave IR. Um, so this brings us to the conclusions. Um, we have demonstrated high-speed microwave uh, photoconductive mid-wave mid IR detection using the whole, whole array pattern in speed materials. And um, by using um, surface recombination to our advantage, we can have effectively tune the detector speed by controlling the pattern dimensions during fabrications. For the long wave IR, we have shown that the ultra thin type two, type two super lattice uh, detector is a great platform for high speed operations, and we can achieve over four over four gigahertz of bandwidth and moderate operating biases. For the future work, the holy detectors can be improved by using uh, first um, even finer scale uh, sc even finer scale um, patterns with high fail factors. Um, alternatively, it can also be uh, applied to, say, uh, materials with higher crystal quality and with long intrinsic, intrinsic lifetimes because we can effectively tune the, the lifetime uh, of these uh, materials with uh, the geometry and we can push for, for both a high band, higher bandwidth and higher responsivity. For the ultra-thin type 2 superlattice detectors, we're still in the process of understanding the transient transport mechanisms, and this can help us design better detectors in the future. Um, for example, we're thinking about using, say, P-type absorbers to utilize the higher mobility of the electrons, and it is also desirable to push uh, to move forward to a gallium arsenide based system, based system because that substrate is electrically more preferred. So these are some work we can do in the future. And that is the end of my presentation today. I would like to thank all the sponsors for making these projects possible. And thank you all for your listening and attention. And I'm open to any questions you might have. All right. Thank you, Yuna, for your excellent presentation. Um, and let's see if we, if we got any questions from the audience. And if you have any questions, you can just type in the chat or just unmute yourself and speak up. Hi, Ian. Um, yeah. Hey. Great, great presentation. Um, I really enjoyed hearing about your work. Um, I had one quick question about the holy detector. Mm -hmm. So 